Come unwrap some holiday magic this season in Denver, where the lights are brighter and the shopping is grander. The shows are more spectacular, the trees taller, the festivities merrier. So come for your holiday traditions or make some new ones with your friends and family in the Mile High City, where the season feels a whole lot more wonderful. Discover great hotels and more things to do at milehighholidays.com. What I find interesting, what I thought I'd share with you, is the way he got out of his service was he basically um, started to say that he had homosexual desires for his shipmates. And they were like, you got you, you to gotta, you gotta get off the boat, bro. Like, it's just, it's such an early 20th century. Like, My name is Richard Dix, and this is How Did That Happen? A podcast where I look at everyday things or events and try to figure out how they came to be. Every week, I will research one topic, and by the end of the episode, I hope to truly have the answer to the question, how did that happen? Hello, and welcome back to another episode of How Did That Happen? HDTH. This week, we are discussing cassette tapes and compact discs. I learn a lot. I'm going to share it with you guys. We learn about where this technology comes from, uh, where, where it started, who started it, all the ideas that had to do with that. But before we get there... As always, seven days a week, you can find out how things happen over at hdthappen.com. There you will find episode transcripts as well as pictures and videos for every episode. Um, there's also a blog over there with articles that are written by yours truly. Uh, I've written on such, thing as, uh, such things as the Uvalde shooting, uh, Takeoff's murder, and even the most recent um, DeMar, DeMar Hamlin's um, cardiac arrest on the football field that's happened this past week. Uh, there's always got a little housekeeping that we like to do before we get the episode started. What am I watching? I just watched uh, Last Seen Alive on Netflix. Uh, stars Gerard Butler, and uh, he ends up he ends up going looking for his wife after she disappears at a gas station. It's got it's it's pretty good if you're just looking for something to kind of you know waste a Saturday afternoon on. I think it's like an hour and a half, maybe a little bit more. Got a lot of twists and turns that do make it make it do that do make it worth a watch. Um, I also just watched that show, the new show Kaleidoscope also on Netflix. Um, the, the interesting thing about this show is you're supposed to be able to watch it, watch the show in whatever order you choose, meaning you can kind of kind of pick as you go. The episodes are named after colors, and the colors are actually represented during the show, so you have like the red episode. People will be wearing red. Things in there will kind of be red tinted. It kind of helps you kind of keep track of what's going on. Um, I love the idea. Love the idea. That being said, I do feel like they missed the mark a little bit because... After watching what I what was the fourth episode for me in a random order, um, I do believe that I came across the actual finale of the show, which I'm like, if this is supposed to be watched in any sort of random order, then there shouldn't be a finale. I mean, am I right? I, I don't know because it was like the credits rolled differently, and if you watched it, you know it wasn't it wasn't the fourth episode, but I just you kind of come to the end, and I I don't know that's the there's no end to a kaleidoscope, but I think that the tech the the, the ideas behind it. Um, are actually pretty cool. I love the idea of watching a show in any kind of order. It's almost the same way as them revolutionizing, you know, the, the this media when they dropped all of House of Cards at the same time, and everybody was like, "Whoa, we can watch the whole season whenever we want," you know. So it's we'll definitely see what uh, what happens as different as different people take different shots with this type of media. Uh, what am I listening to? I actually just started listening to um, this podcast called Majority 54, and I haven't quite figured them out. I'm still kind of feeling them out, but it is a, it's a political podcast, which I you know I kind of take those with a grain of salt here and there. But the, the hosts are actually somewhat personable. I don't even know their names yet because I'm still kind of just it's more, it's more of a thing when it pops up on my, my, my Apple podcast, I let it play, whereas I normally would kind of skip it. So I'm kind of still figuring them out, but they are, they are kind of funny and they give you they provide a more palatable way um, to digest American politics, which is always helpful. And then I'm always listening to the Honeydew, which is one of my all-time favorites. Um, they, t- they, they, they take the kind of the bad stories that happen in, in people's lives and make them funny, or at least not as dark as they really are. You know, they, 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 I think they, he calls it highlighting the lowlights. You know, I wouldn't call it making light of things, but kind of just more viewing things from a different perspective. Um, and, and as always over here, we have the mini sewed for HDTH, which is Bite Size Bios. Uh, comes out every Thursday at 4.30 a.m. This most recent episode we did um, was on Morgan Freeman, and it actually came out a little bit late because due to all the holidays and stuff like that, I, l- I literally thought that I was a day ahead of myself. Like I almost didn't record that episode because I thought I had another day. I woke up, and I thought that Thursday was Wednesday until about 7 a.m. when I was like, oh, no. Well, you know, I saw, um, you know, full disclosure, it was, my, it was my brother's birthday, and I saw it. I was like, well, his birthday's Thursday. 
there should be a podcast out today. It's not the Wednesday you thought it was. It was a whole thing. But so yeah, Morgan Freeman. We learned about his life. We learned that he was in the Air Force. Um, he's a junior. Learned that he trademarked his name. Interesting thing. Um, but yeah, definitely go check that out. We we profiled now 14 different people. Uh, we've done we've done Oprah. We've done Condoleezza Rice. We've done um, Napoleon Bonaparte, Benjamin Franklin, Jeff Bezos. Um, who else have we done? Chuck Norris, Houdini, you know, just, just to name a few. And there's others over there. If you want to go check it out, you can find out all the transcripts. If you don't want to listen to it, you can read about it at hdthappen.com. And as always, if you like what you're hearing here, be sure to give a like and subscribe. Maybe even give us five stars if you feel so inclined. As, or as I always say, if you want to give us two stars with some constructive criticism that tells us why you didn't want to give us five stars, I love that as well. And I did want to say, if you don't understand the whole subscribing thing, I understand how that works and how it's important to us. It really, because I've had people ask, like, oh, when is your next pod coming out? Well, if you just subscribe to it, you don't have to. It just shows up in your feed. Boom, it's right there. It's not even about me trying to be vain. It's more just like if you want to, you want more HTTH and you want it on demand, you press that little plus button, to, you know, to give us a follow and a subscribe and it shows up right there on your phone or wherever you actually listen to podcasts. But I do believe that is about it before we actually get into the episode. I hope you guys like it. We have a whole nother year of trying to find out how things happen set up for you guys. So without further ado, as we're known to do, here is the episode. Okay, so before we can start talking about cassette tapes, we have to actually talk about the technology that would be that would end up being invented that would create the, the cassette tape, if you will. Um, and so before the cassette tape, in 1935, there was a company uh, called AEG uh, and that was created in Germany. And it's AEG stands for Allgemeine Elektrizität Gesundschaft, which uh, that's pretty fun to say. Um, but it was like really the first reel-to-reel tape recorder, and its commercial name was the Magnetophone. Magnetophone. Um, and a- AEG is a, a German company that began all, all the way back in 1883. Um, they initially first uh, started making light bulbs and different generators and motors and stuff like that. Uh, the, the, mag- the Magnetophone technology would not come along until, 19, until the late uh, 20s, 1927, 19, 1928, uh, when a man by the name of Fritz Flume. Um, basically got invented the idea of, of magnetic tape. And that's what the whole idea of the cassette tape almost kind of runs off of, um, is the magnetic tape. So he had, he, did, he had developed a process for putting metal stripes on cigarette papers, I guess going, going around them, and he reasoned that he could do the same thing. Uh, he, he could code a magnetic stripe to be used to, for wire recording as well. And so in 1927, after experimenting with various materials, he used very thin paper that was coated with iron oxide powder and using a lacquer as glue, and he received a patent a year later. And so that was around the time that AEG started to actually work with the idea of the tape recorder. So on December 1st, 1932, uh, Flumer granted AEG the right to use his invention when building the world's first reel-to-reel uh, tape recorder. And the, the magnetic phone, excuse me, the, the magnetophone uh, tape recorder was one of the first recording machines to use magnetic tape in preserving voice and music. That is the basic technology behind cassette tapes. Like I was saying before, it was a lot of like uh, the, the, the shellac or we talk about or vinyl. We've covered vinyl records um, on, I believe it was episode 15. I'm not sure, but we definitely talked about those. But that used to be the preferred way to do it. And we'll see actually later on that it still was still hard to get those out of the mainstream when different technologies were brought in. And it's important to note that this was all happening in Europe, uh, most mainly in Germany, which is where the, te- the technology originated. These machines were very expensive and uh, relatively difficult to use, and they were therefore only used by professionals and in radio stations and recording studios. One of the first concerts to be recorded on a magnetic phone, on, I keep calling it magnetic phone, it's a magneto phone, um, on, the, on a magnetophone was Mozart's 39th Symphony, uh, played by the London Philharmonic Orchestra, and this was um, in 1936. One of their um, more prolific and infamous users uh, would uh, actually be Adolf Hitler. He found this technology very useful uh, throughout the war, and he used these machines to perform what appeared to be live broadcasts from one city to another while, while he was actually in different cities. And so if you ever... Um, look, look, look at those or listen to those old broadcasts. He was, I never know, I don't speak German, but basically it was, he was tricking the people into thinking that he was in the city delivering a live broadcast because they would, I guess, play it over loudspeakers, but he was actually, you know, somewhere else, but it kind of gave the idea that he was everywhere. Um, they found a whole bunch of these tapes. 
So the, the next time you hear um, a Hitler speech was more than likely recorded on a, on a magnetophone. And this was actually another um, a piece, a very important piece that the Germans were using during World War II. It was a very closely guarded secret at the time. Um, the Allies were aware that it existed because it, it had existed before the war time, but they didn't, obviously they didn't know how the technology worked specifically, and so they couldn't recreate it. Um, but like, like I said, they knew that it existed, but they, they did not know the full details of its construction. This would not happen until they actually invaded Germany in 1944. And so this is basically what this, the basically the Allied invasion of Germany, is what brings the cassette tape technology to America, to, yeah, basically, because we wouldn't have had it without that. And so you, what you see is that near the end of the war, um, while serving in the U.S. Army Signal Corps, there was a major uh, named Jack Mullen who was assigned to investigate German radio and electronic experiments. He was the one who found the, uh, the magnetophones uh, on a trip in Frankfurt, I believe they say. And so it was really easy for these guys to just kind of take take the technology because what happened, I mean, when, when we, we all know the, the history of what happened, Germany loses the war, and so the copyrights that everybody had on all this technology and all, all this recording equipment kind of just goes out, it goes out the window when Germany itself is barely even a country anymore. And so these guys kind of just hop onto it and take it for themselves. You know, so because like I said, all the all the companies who had rights, all the German companies lost all their rights when the when when the, when the war was over. And so Mullen, well, Major Mullen, he got two of these magnetophone guys, uh, the these magnetophone recorders, and he brought them back to America and he produced copies basically. And he demonstrated them to the Institute of Radio Engineers in San Francisco on May 16, 1946. So it's really interesting. You can't gloss over the fact that we wouldn't have cassette tapes if it weren't for World War Two. I mean, I would not have gotten into this thinking that that'd be the case. I definitely wouldn't. I thought this was just made, I don't know, honestly, by just like some nerd in, you know, Idaho. I don't know. Like, but we see that there's, and, and we'll see even, even later on with the, with, with, um, with compact disc and all that different stuff. I mean, depending on how you think of the first, um, a lot of them do, um, a lot of the, 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 the first attempts come from, from Germany. And so like, basically, you know, the technology from then would just kind of continue to go on and, um, and become more easy to use by 1953. Uh, one million homes, one million U.S. homes had had tape recorder machines. Um, they were first used in studios to record radio programs, but they quickly found their ways, like I say, into schools and homes. Um, in 1958, following four years of development, RCA Victor um, introduced a stereo quarter-inch uh, reversible reel-to-reel tape cartridge, uh, tape cartridge, which which allowed, you know, more just. The, the continued spread of the, the the cassette tape basically and the victor the the victor machine would act, would actually go on to fail but it would serve to kind of create the basis the foundation for people wanting to have some sort of like recording machine in their home we will get to actually the the real uh cassette tape as we know it here in a second but we're going to start with the eight track tape which i think a lot of people um have of, of, of older um people who are a little older may know more about i have only heard about it in my life i've actually found out a lot of things about not just the a-track but, but but about compact discs that i had no idea because like i mean i'm only, I'm only 31 uh so a lot of this stuff the technology and how it how it got here already happened by the time i was coherent and so we see that in 1953 a man by the name of george ish i think it's ish it's e-a-s-h um and he invented uh basically a what did, what did they call it? A, a Fidelipak cartridge, which was also known as the NAB cartridge. And it was formerly called the Stereo 8, um, which is a magnetic tape uh, sound recording technology that became popular in the mid-60s. Uh, the popularity of both the 4-track and the 8-track car cartridges grew from the booming automobile industry, and that's because um, in 1965, the Ford Motor Company, the Ford Motor Company introduced factory-installed and dealer-installed 8-track tape players as an option on three of its 1966 models. And that's we see that happen with a lot of different things that the, the auto industry may kind of makes things ubiquitous in, in life and, and, and technology. That we, saw, we saw the same way with, um, I believe it was Cadillac and the windshield wipers. It wasn't, it wasn't really until Cadillac made them standard on their cars that they really be, even became a staple in the automobile industry. They were, they were optional, like, like, like even the windshields were initially. And so uh, 1978 was the peak year for 8-track sales in the U.S. Um, they pretty much started to decline after that and then what we'll see is like i said we'll get to the actual the the creation of the cassette tape as we know it right and so the father of the cassette tape is a man by the name of lou ottens and old lou otten lou lou as we'll call him 
was born on June 21st, 1926, in a village in the, in the Netherlands. The village is called, I think, Belling, Bellingwold, is how, they, is how they pronounce it? Probably not, but that's, that's how I just did. Um, he always had an interest in technology, even from an early age. He also has a World War II origin story, as a lot of these guys at his age do. Uh, while in his teens, during the German occupation of the Netherlands, he constructed a radio that would use that he would secretly use to listen to the Radio Orange broadcast, which I don't know what that is. I actually just looked that up. The Radio Orange, the Radio Orange broadcasts were um, they were broadcasts that were coming from London in in World War, in World War II that were about basically just telling them what was going on, the current state of affairs in the world, and and with the war. They were like fifteen minute broadcasts. That's pretty interesting. I just thought, I think when you put a J in an orange, it just sounds so much cooler than just saying orange. It's like orange. But so, yeah, after the war, he, um, he went to school at the Delft University of Technology. Um, he started working as a drafting technician for an x-ray technology factory, and then he would go on to work for Philips. The company Philips created two different design teams uh, to try to make a tape cartridge for thinner and narrower t- like tape like players, basically, so that they could use you know, what was in the reel-to-reel tape technology, but make it more of a compact sort of design. Um, we'll see the word compact will come back uh, a lot throughout this, actually. And Lou Otten's team was the winner. When they picked his design, um, his design was the two-spool cartridge that we all know and love, um, and they introduced it into Europe, in, in, into the European market at the Berlin Radio Show in August, uh, August 30th, 1963. And in 1964, um, it would come to America under the Norelco brand. And it's important to mention that uh, they trademarked the name Compact um, because the Compact set came a year later. So, and that's something that I don't think anybody, I never put two and two together until almost the end of, do- the end of doing this research that that's where the term Compact Disc comes from because it's, it's com- compact. Philips is also the one who kind of created and marketed the Compact Discs. And so they used the, t- the same name, Compact, to make people think back to the idea of the compact cassette. So that's where the CD, that's where the C in, you know, CD comes from. I, you think it just comes from the idea of being compact, but it's even deeper than that. It actually goes back to a trademark that they made back in the mid 60s. Phillips also offered a machine to play and record the cassettes because that's what's kind of this whole compact thing that's what bring about the whole bring your music with you sort of thing. And they would, it was called the Phillips TYP L3300. Uh, and they made a couple of those throughout the years. And by 1966, um, over two, over a quarter million recorders had been sold in the U.S. alone. Um, and Japan soon became the major source of recorders as well. Uh, by 1968, there were more than 85 different manufacturers that had sold more than 2.4 million players. And what we'll see, actually, as we go on here, something that something that I never really thought of, is that when you start to start to change the technology for how, for how people listen to audio of any kind, then the audio you know, at least for that, at, at that point, you had to have some sort of audio player. And so that would have to change as well. And so that we was, we'll see that that actually is one of the reasons why a lot of companies are reluctant to take these, um, the new technology, not, not because it may not be better, but because it could cost more money for them to change all of the stuff they have to do, you know, to, to outfit their, their, their factories to now make CDs instead of vinyl or to make tapes instead of vinyl or anything like that. It makes them want to just, you know, just keep with what they're doing, even if, you know, the new technology might be better. And so by the, we'll see by the end of the 60s, the cassette business was worth more than $150 million. So let's, let, let's not forget here, folks, that it all came from Nazi technology. I mean, I guess not Nazi, but pretty much Nazi technology. And it was basically taken during the war. And cut to 20 years later, and it's a $150 million business. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. Whether you're making a traditional roasted turkey or spicy turkey tacos your go-to shrimp cocktail, or your first Cajun risotto. Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace your traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Choose from a great selection of digital coupons and use them up to five times in one transaction. Check our app for details. Baker's, fresh for everyone. I just think that's, that's kind of why I look into this stuff, because that's, I, who knew? I, I, I had no idea. And so that will bring us into the 70s, and we can talk about the Walkman, the Sony Walkman. It went on sale for the very first time, I believe, on July the 1st, 1979. And so it's, it's an interesting idea or theory or perspective to look at and to say that the Walkman wasn't really a breakthrough in technology of sorts, but more in like in like in imagination or like the idea of how you could have music or audio with you. Because everything that the Walkman, 
everything that that the Walkman needed to needed to exist already existed. It, it wasn't like I don't know. It wasn't like we're seeing the iPod or something like that. It was like everything was already there. And we'll find actually that the the Walkman itself was already a prototype that existed for journalists. It had just never been thought of to put into music form. That's what that's what we kind of mean about the idea of like the breakthrough in imagination because it was already there. It's just about the way that you look at it. And so the first time they actually ever really thought about using it for music was when the the chairman of Sony uh, was a really big opera guy. He, as I said before, is, is these older guys, they all have these World War II origin stories. He was in the Imperial Japanese Navy during World War II. It's just, it's interesting when you look at, like, all these guys were in, like, the same club, if you will. But so he was really into opera, and he wanted a way to listen to his opera while he was on all his flights to do his business. And so he asked um, the good people at Sony, his company, to make him something he could do that with. And what they did is basically, they basically repurposed, um, let's see, I think, I think it was the TCD5 uh, is, is, is what they called it, which was already there, was for, like I said, was for the journalist. And so they made a couple of tweaks and gave it to him with some different headphones because it was, I guess, it was a larger thing. It wasn't as portable as the Walkman is or was. And he loved it. And so they were like, we got to make this for everybody else. We're going to make it for the public. When they are, and this is another part of like the idea of breaking through with imagination, because when they were really, some of the questions they had to ask themselves when they were trying to make this product and make it marketable to the public is, because this, this had really never been done before, was would somebody buy a cassette device that was based around playback and not recording? Because even the ones that, they, that, they, that they're using as their, as, their, as their prototype, like I said, was for journalists, it was for recording things. Yes, you could listen back to it once you did it, but the main focus of the device itself was to, for recording. This would all be only for playback. This would be so you could play whatever tape you bought. And so it was like they felt like they were really kind of reinventing the wheel. Um, but the, the, the chairman of Sony was, was mentioned, a question that he asked, which seems so simple but so profound later, is don't you think a stereo cassette player that you can listen to while walking walking around is a good idea. It's a simple question, and like yes, we see that now. I mean, it's that's that that is, it's the future. We have it in different ways now, but I mean, it, this is basically what created the craze of having music in your pocket. I mean, Steve Jobs can thank Ibuka. What's his first name? Sirio. What's? Oh, let me go back up here. Let's, let's get this man his flowers. Uh, Masaru Masaru Ibuka, not Sirio. I don't know where I got Sirio from. But what I, and what I didn't know, and this makes sense because I guess I've I've heard from people that are older than me that they were you know they were a, a commodity a hot commodity I didn't, I didn't know they were so expensive when they first came out they released for 150 dollars in 1979 which is a lot of money right now so i couldn't even imagine in 1979 i mean as far as just for something you just listen to music on 150 dollars that's a lot so i see when people say they were getting stolen and different and, and different things like that but they, they sold really well and some of the first initial actual names for the walkman it kind of changed depending on what market they were in um they were called soundabouts in some places which Sounds very European. I'm not sure what, what that, I didn't see which market it was in, but it sounds like I can hear that in, in Europe. Um, and then there was it was also called also called the freestyle. But by the 80s, uh, it was basically all just called the Walkman. And the Walkman for 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 Sony has, has basically been you know one of their. It was I guess you could say like like the like the iPod for Apple. It, it evolved throughout all the different types of technology. They did CDs, they did MP3s, and even now I think they said the Sony Music app is actually called the Walkman. So kind of some stuff that they've kept with them throughout their entirety. But so we will go from cassette tapes and the Walkman to now the compact disc, which I think uh, if I was going to do, because this, this initially started as just the cassette tape. But once I did that, I realized, well, I mean, you gotta, you can't mention one without the other. And they kind of do go hand in hand as, you know, as things continue, because like I say, we'll see the same company um, that created that created the cassette tape had a large hand in creating the, the compact disc as well. But the first actual created version of the compact disc is not quite what you would think, or at least not how I would think. So the the, the first workable compact disc was invented by American physicist and music lover James Russell in 1966. Um, Russell was born in, in 1931 in Bremerton, Washington. He went to Reed College. In the early 50s and received a BA in physics and it's interesting that he went to read college because that's exactly where Steve Jobs went as well so you, you're telling me the guy that made the comp the very first compact disc and the guy that made Apple and the iPod went to the same college but just 20 years apart it's got to be something in the water out there I don't know I mean that's just there's I find it interesting but what I also find interesting about his creation is that he created a version of the CD that didn't actually spin that's where his is different it was the first is not what we know now 
Um, but it, the first one didn't actually spin. It had it was the same kind of disc, but he had a little rotating arm that would rotate around it, almost similar to, to like a vinyl, but it, it wouldn't touch. I'm just saying it would it would it would, it would you know circulate the disc itself, um, and and that would be a data reader on that. That's how it would get the the, the information. And he did this because he was he found himself basically frustrated with the, with the poor sound that was coming from his vinyl, and so he, he worked with that for a little bit before finally deciding to try to invent the first compact disc, and so. Obviously, it's not the one that we know, and so he doesn't get as much play as far as like being the guy who made it. But I thought we should include him first before we actually get to the one that we we know and and, and actually gets made um, the actual compact disc CD that we that we all know and love. All right, yeah, and, and so we'll start quickly with how CDs work. So the technology of the compact disc can be grouped into three key components: uh, digital data processing, optics, and mechanics. The basic mechanics of the CD is that a uh, laser beam is focused onto the surface that, can, that contains digital information uh, in the form of tiny pits. Due to the mirrored surface of the disc, the laser beam is reflected uh, with a pattern of the pits to a photodiode, photo, photodiode, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. The signal is then detected and converted into analog audio information, so that's how we basically get from the shiny disc to actually some sort of actual data. So, into a man named Norio Oga who was an opera singer before he started to work for Sony in a number of different capacities, and he would eventually go on to become the CEO of Sony, and he is also considered to be the father of the CD, the compact disc. Initially, Oga headed Sony's tape recorder division, which is our, he was basically one of the people behind the Walkman, and so that was very successful, so when he started to say something else about let's make this new thing, they all kind of, you know, they at least listened. They weren't, they weren't very, they weren't initially all sold, but they at least gave him enough money to kind of tinker with it and kind of create some 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 inventions, and so he would actually end up teaming up with Philips um, in the late seventies to kind of kind of try to get this going. It was he who actually pushed for the disc to be twelve centimeters um, in diameter because it provided a sufficient listening capacity. So he says at seventy five minutes, and that was actually long enough to store all of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which he believes should be heard in its entirety. So that's one of the reasons why the CD is the size that it is, is because of Beethoven. And so Philips and Sony kind of worked together to make. Uh, the, the what they call what is it called the compact disc digital audio system and that's kind of the the whole package if you will the 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 the, the CD and the CD player now not the CD player you know but um, as far as when they made the first compact disc they had to have a player to play it as well and so their partnership would end in 1981 um, not like a, in a in a bad way it was just they kind of at this point like we've made it now we have to go start making we want to go start making different things because we're different companies. Uh, but they agreed that if either of the companies was ever unable to design a commercial product, that the other would donate its its design. You know, so the they were they were trying to help each other out, but it was just like now it's time to go separate ways. Um, the agreement was not actually needed. The compact disc was introduced in Europe and Japan, and then in the United States. And to ensure that the players would actually be used and can and could be marketed well, uh, Sony and Philips both liberally licensed their technology, meaning if you wanted it, you could pretty much get it. We talked about that with the USB port and different. The idea behind technology and the, the creation of it, you know, it, it can be a great invention, but if you don't let the masses use it, then it's then it's basically no good, or it's not no good, but it won't, it won't soar to the heights that you had initially envisioned when you created it. And so by 1985, roughly 25 million CDs um, had been sold and 5 million CD players had been sold. That's an interesting um, number ratio. And so a year after that, those numbers had doubled. And we start to see the, you know, the vinyl kind of, the vinyl sales to start to decline. And just four years after being introduced, the CDs were actually established as the principal audio medium in the music industry. Industry. So it, took, it only took four years for them to become, you know, ubiquitous, basically. And I believe they say, I don't know if I'm going to say it later, but I, but I think they say that the, the peak year for CD sales was, I believe, the year 2000. I think they say that's when like, the most CDs were ever sold. Um, was around then and so we'll go from the CDs to the CD cases and this is something that I didn't know um, that much about we're not going to cover too much more about it we're going to cover the CD cases some CD standards and then that's pretty much it we're going to I'm going to leave DVDs and stuff like that out I was going to include that but I'm definitely now that I've done this going to do a DVD and Blu-ray and probably VHS episodes there's no point in kind of just tack and keep tacking things on but so when the CD cases when they first came out they came out of what are called long boxes like I said this you know this predates my you know, CD um, shopping. They were like 12 inch cases, cardboard cases, and, some, and sometimes plastic. And they were designed in part to make it easier to flip through, 
um, when they were people were looking for them, but also designed to help keep them keep them from being stolen. So the idea is if we make these things big enough, people can't walk out with them, which was also a large issue that um, stores had, or like one of the problems they had when when Sony and Philips came to them with the idea of of making CDs instead of vinyl. They were like, well, if you make them that small, people are just going to walk out with them. Like we can't really control, we can't watch them as much. It's a, it's a lot harder to walk out with like a, a twelve foot a foot you know long vinyl you know copy as opposed to like a you know a six inch you know, CD, but so that was their first um, idea to kind of help prevent theft. Um, but they were said the long boxes were said to be responsible for creating more than 18.5 million pounds of extra trash each year. Um, and after a public outcry, they were eventually replaced with plastic keeper boxes um, that will be unlocked. And that's kind of what I know. And they, they were they were kind of the the, 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 the the plastic things that you would kind of flip through and you, you wouldn't take those home. They'd be taken off before you leave the store. And then we just get down to the actual cellophane uh, wrap jewel cases that we have now. And so that's kind of the evolution of the, of the actual compact disc case. Uh, the last thing, like I said, before we get out of here is they're actually just this. I thought this was interesting. I'm not going to read to you the entire thing that I have here, which is basically the entire schematics of um, what a CD should be. But they are all released in what's called a red book. And that happened in, uh, like in 1980. It's kind of just what it's the reason why I think if you were ever to get a CD that was kind of either counterfeit or maybe from a made from an outside these standards you put it inside your your like your cd player or like your 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 computer or something and it doesn't play it's because it doesn't it doesn't actually hold up there to these standards so there are a specific amount um of, of of statistics that these cds have to meet before they can actually be considered to be a compact disc um like i said that's all laid out in the red book then you have the yellow book which came a little bit later and this i find to be interesting because this is has to do with the idea of rewritable discs, and there is that it's a little less of a wild west now, but it definitely was much more of a wild west as far as you could do whatever you want, and they were selling different discs. And this is this is trying to they they never nailed this down. Also, is interesting, which is why you still have things like the CDR um, and the CDRW and different things like that. And that is how CDs and cassette tapes happened. And now it's time for the roundup. The roundup. The roundup. And we're going to round it up. Cassette tape technology came from Germany. It was brought back after World War II. The company Philips creates the first marketable cassette tape. The first compact disc did not spin. Philips and Sony worked together to create the first marketable compact disc. Things I didn't know before. And now I know them. Never heard of these things. What are they? Alright, so um, for the things I didn't know before segment, I have a couple for you and then we'll go ahead and get you out of here. Um, the first one is that I, I see. And this, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I found this because a lot of things that I see, say the first uh, CD that was ever made or produced was the the, see the album uh, The Visitors by ABBA, which that's kind of true, but not completely. That was actually like the first like like pop music CD that was actually ever made. So the first test pressing of a CD recording uh, that was ever made was um, was it was of an, uh, an Alpine Symphony that was played by the uh, the Berlin Philhar Philharmonic. Um, and then the actual first public demonstration of, of a CD was the Bee Gees. It was, it was an album um, done by the Bee Gees called Living Eyes in 1981. So it was the same year as ABBA, but this was actually, I guess, the first time that people would ever see it before it could be released to the masses uh, to, for, for purchase. Let's see, the, the, the first CD player that was ever released to play these CDs was actually was $1,500. So when you think about it, I mean, we, we talked about how, how much the, the Walkman cost. It was like it was $150 when it first came out. I mean, that's just wild that someone would pay fifteen hundred dollars to play it to play a cd and i like i like cds um the last one that i have is just it is another one of those um like i say there you find stuff out when you're looking this stuff up and i i realized when i was doing it that a lot of these guys that we talked about in this episode had ties back to world war ii and so i was looking up other people who probably who you didn't know served in world war ii one of them was the comedian lenny bruce now, i know who he is um, but I didn't know much about his life. But what I see is that he actually, he was, I found, what I found is that he, he joined the military at a very young age, like a lot of these guys did. He dropped out of high school, 
um, to join the war right after the U.S. entered World War II, and he spent a lot of time on his, on his ship called the USS Brooklyn. He did it for years, actually, uh, for a few years, and then he got tired of it. And what I, what I find interesting, what I thought I'd share with you, is the way he got out of his service was he basically um, started to say that he had homosexual desires for his shipmates. And they were like, you got you, you got it, you got to get off the boat, bro. Like, it's just, it's such an early 20th century, like, he couldn't figure out how else to go home, but to just be like, just, I guess, to start coming on to people. I just thought that was really interesting. And he goes on to be a great comedian, so he just, he finds a funny way to get out of, of situations. Uh, but yeah. All right, that was another episode of How Did That Happen? We learned a lot about cassette tapes and compact discs. I know I had no idea they were connected to possible Nazi research or at least, you know, German research that came our way through Nazis and how much Hitler actually enjoyed it. Uh, but I hope you guys actually enjoyed it. As always, if you loved what you heard here, there is more where that came from over at HDTHappen.com. As always, there you will find a written version of what you just heard as well as photos and videos that helped me create the episode. There will be a work cited there as well to show you where I got all the information from. Like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. It really helps the pod grow. As I always say, give us five stars if you can, but if not and you want to give us two stars and tell us why you don't want to give us five stars, that's fine as well. Thank you guys for always pressing play, and we'll see you in a couple days with the next Bite Size Bios. When you download the Baker's app, you have easy access to savings every day. Get the most out of weekly sales and receive personalized coupons to save on your favorite items, all while earning one fuel point for every dollar spent. Baker's makes it easy to save while you shop, whether it's in-store or online, so you get the most value out of every trip, every time. Download the Baker's app now to save big on your next purchase. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Must have a digital account to redeem offers. Restrictions may apply. See site for details. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. Whether you're making a traditional roasted turkey or spicy turkey tacos, your go-to shrimp cocktail, or your first Cajun risotto, Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace your traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Choose from a great selection of digital coupons and use them up to five times in one transaction. Check our app for details. Baker's, fresh for everyone.